Yeah, I just want to start off by saying um, I was I had cultic involvement for just over 18 years and um, <laughs> a fun little story with Scientology for me. I was reading Dianetics uh, a while back just of my own accord and this lady came up to me and started screaming at me and I got very fascinated because I knew nothing about Scientology. Mm -hmm. So I started researching and poking around. I'm like, wow, this is fascinating. And I was reading all these books and um, I literally went to my cult leader and I said, we have to be careful and not end up like the Scientologists Absolutely. and let's not become a cult. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we had conversations about it. And so anyway, in my cult research, I had come across your YouTube channel, John Atak and Friends. So um, you don't know me yet, but we actually, I, we go way back, uh, at least a decade. <laughs> I've been enjoying your videos for a long time and really thankful you're here. Thank you so much, John. I'll, I'll turn it over to questions and everything else. But yeah, I really want to say I've loved your channel and we love the book and yeah thanks again for coming in today my pleasure thank you i'd like to pipe up with one acknowledgement as well mm -hmm. uh john your book along with some nudging from family uh got me out of a born in situation in scientology your oh. book a piece of, your book a piece of blue sky absolutely cinched it and I've been on a trek to understand that. Um, I'm almost through to a certain point. I'm a little bit uh, still working on things, shall we say. But um, I just thank you very much for all the work you've done. Um, it's been wonderful. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. That, that's very encouraging. Thank you. How long ago did you leave? Uh, just about two years ago. Wow. So, yeah. Yes. And again, born in, so my entire life, basically. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that, that, that's, yeah. that's so gratifying to hear. Thank you. Yeah, and that, that was a yeah, story. Well, you're point. welcome. Um, yeah, if, if, if nothing else, uh, uh, I wanted to hear a lot of us are, I'm a year and a half out. Um, yeah, Susan there is two years out. A lot of us are one and a half, two, three years out. Someone's working on a... Um, uh, twin flames thing and I'll let everyone else speak but I would love to start because you've been out quite a while John is there anything um, I just love talking to people been out 10 years 15 years 20 years um, can you offer any words of wisdom uh, as a long timer out if, if that's an okay place to start I'd love some words of encouragement because yeah we're all here pretty fresh and it's raw yeah absolutely well um, in six days time it will be 40 years since I resigned from the Church of Scientology. Um, and my involvement, I was involved for nine years, um, but it was as a public Scientologist, never as a staff Scientologist. And so I didn't realize that I was meant to be frightened of them. And as soon as I put my head above the parapet, which as I say was on the 18th of October, 1983, I started being harassed. And that carried on for 16 years solid. Um, we've got somebody else in the, in the waiting room here. Yep. I just let her in. She's, she's, good. she's good. great. Um, so the, it's very variable how people recover, um, over the years, I, you know, and I'm not involved with this anymore, but over the years, well, occasionally I am, uh, I am today, obviously over the years I've, I've dealt with the recovery of about 600 people. Um, directly and i think that you know often therapists misunderstand the problem and and will try to fit their sort of cookie cookie cutter solution and they'll sort of you know well, what was your childhood like or they'll try cognitive behavioral work on you or something like that now that may ultimately be helpful but before you get to that you have to penetrate what i call the cultic shell which is the identity that you have as a cult member, um, which is, you know, I, I'm not a fan of Freud at all, but the idea of a superego, of a kind of indwelling policeman that tells you what you're meant to think and how you're meant to behave is an aspect of, of cult membership. So that, that there are a set of rules. Um, my dear friend, Cyril, late friend Cyril Vosper, who wrote a book called The Mindbenders about Scientology in 1968. I met him 14 years after he'd left, and he said he'd still be crossing the street and, and wondering to himself, have I committed an overt? So it was still very much in his head. Um, 
and indeed many years later he, he did a tv interview for a friend of mine and uh, started talking about reincarnation and he's act has actually featured in a hubbard book have you lived before this life his name was taken out obviously along the way but he was one of the original people in that and he still firmly believed in it now i don't have any problem with that i don't have a particular problem with what people believe i'm agnostic you know which which is a very safe and wonderful place to be i don't have to believe anything um but whatever people believe that that's up to them as long as they don't then use their beliefs to harm others and as long as it doesn't make them believe that they're superior to other people or that they can look down on other people or that they can harm other people i don't care what people believe but what i do see is is that there are persistent beliefs and there's a problem that most therapists won't sort of go what do you believe and so with Scientology, for example, there is the idea, there are certain foundational ideas. So the idea that um, affinity, reality, which Hubbard defines as agreement and communication, create understanding. And this is the primary triangular relationship of Scientology. And what he said is that if you increase communication, you will always increase affinity. So if you communicate with somebody, they'll always like you more. But Hubbard also said bullets too are communication, which gives you the slight problem with his formula that in fact, if you shoot somebody, they probably won't like you more. So this whole principle upon which Scientology is erected is nonsense. And the first stage, the story I tell is this uh, an Australian friend of mine, and when we first spoke, she said, is reality an agreement? As Hubbard says, you know, are we all of us agreeing and creating this illusion between us. And I said, well, yeah, if you're the hypnotist, yes, reality is an agreement. Uh, people will believe what you believe, but otherwise, no, the world is out there, whether you like it or not. And, you know, how you perceive it and, you know, your internal reality, which, uh, you know, Hubbard talked about having your own universe and the external universe. But um, the, the idea is not original. I'm told Immanuel Kant talked about it in the 18th century. So we all have we live in our perception and interpretation of the world, every one of us. And that's fine, as long as it's somewhere close to the reality of what's around us. Anyway, I, I said to my friend um, in our first conversation, no, you know, unless you're the hypnotist. The next week when she spoke, spoke to me, she was jubilant. She said, I've used scented laundry conditioner. Now, we hadn't had any conversation about L. Ron Hubbard's scent phobia hubbard wouldn't have once you joined the sea organization you were not allowed to use perfume shampoos soaps anything because he was hypersensitive to smell which seems to be a part of i think he probably had temporal lobe epilepsy i think the same is true for rajneesh who had sniffers stopping people from coming into the room if if there was any odor or perfume to them and this is how recovery occurs when you are willing to challenge the beliefs of the group where you're willing to say well actually that doesn't make sense the next step is when you think about something being willing to say well actually that does make sense so there may be things that were within the teaching that are useful to you um yeah when hubbard said more communication not less is the solution that was a good idea when he said you can't talk to people that i've called suppressive and you mustn't talk about your problems your case so-called and you can't talk about the technology he went against that principle which is a large part of how cults work um, with these double binds where you're told this is true and the opposite is true and you get stuck in the middle having to ask permission to do something so you know for me the, the way you pierce the cultic shell is by being willing to challenge the ideas of the group and also being willing to accept that, you know, where they're sensible, they're sensible. And that gradually separates you out and reclaims your individuality. And there may then come a point where counseling or therapy will, will be useful. But I must say that in most cases that that doesn't happen. People do recover. It's also really important. I, I pulled my friend Hoyt Richards up short a couple of years ago. He was working on the documentary Seduced, 
about Nixium. And he said he'd taken all of the women victims of Jeunesse in, in Nixium, the ones who were branded on the side of their pubic mm. mound with Keith Ranieri's initials. He'd taken them aside and said, recovery takes a long time. And I pulled him up and said, no, recovery can happen in a moment. Recovery can take a week. It can take a year. It, and it's a process of it's a process of maturing. It's a process of becoming more aware of the world and bringing back the locus of control to yourself so that you make your decisions, you accept your feelings um, and, and can therefore you know, be able to make progress and, and make a good life because the principal aspect of cults is the phobia that once you leave, everything will fall apart. You know, if you leave the moon is all of your ancestors will be damned. Now, they haven't really thought about genetics because you had two parents, four grandparents, eight grandparents. So if all my ancestors are damned to a thousand generation, then probably all of theirs are too, because, you know, I mean, a quarter of us are meant to be descended from Genghis Khan, you know, who certainly hope was damned at some point. So, you know, but that phobia of, of what will go wrong and understanding that in fact by integrating the cultic experience by digesting the cultic experience you become more and you actually probably become more than you would have done otherwise you know by realizing your own fragility you know whenever i want to ridicule somebody i remember that i did ot3 in scientology and believed that i was packed with little body thetans you know so i i have no position to um to give superiority over anybody. I'm a fool, fundamentally. So yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> of course. Who's next? What do you want to know? I have a question just kind of piggybacking on what you were just talking about. Um, our, uh, Bo and I came out of the same cult. I'm about a year out and I was in for about a decade. And our particular cult leader did a lot of fear indoctrination. Mm -hmm. um, he, over many years, led us to believe that any, even a negative thought against him, let alone rising up and, you know, cr critiquing him publicly, mm -hmm. um, would lead to eons of hellish karma that is irredeemable. I mean, this is this was the message. And so, so, that, so you were dealing with somebody who was an ultimate narcissist. <laughs> malignant to the core. Yeah, yeah. I see it so clearly now. Um, mm. But of course, then I didn't see it. No. What I notice in myself is I intellectually understand that that is nonsense. But something in my bones is afraid. <laughs> and I'm wondering how or when, or if, I mean, I imagine it's just a, a matter of time as time passes and we continue to gather more information that that dissipates. Hmm. And uh, it's awful to consider the possibility that when I'm 80 years old, I'm still gonna have this terror. <laughs> you won't, Good. you won't. Um, yes, and, and you have, you've hit the nail on the head. The, the important, you know, it, it's like with former Jehovah's Witnesses, um, that if you mention the word, you can see how, how well they've recovered by looking at them and saying the word Armageddon. And if they do that, then there's still a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> I mean, my friend Steve Hassan would say, you, you put the cult leader in, in the proper light. So you, you ridicule the cult leader. You look at the, the cult leader's weaknesses, the cult leader's foibles, um, and you know, understand that just about everybody that runs a cult is a malignant narcissist. Um, they also tend often to have bipolar disorder. Uh, and I think with some frequency, they have temporal lobe epilepsy. And I've, I've done um, a few th shows with um, Yuval Laor uh, about that. And he came to me. I did a, a conference in Toronto in 2015, and this huge man wanders up and says, uh, have you ever wondered if, if Ron Hubbard had temporal lobe epilepsy? And I went, not really. <laughs> and, uh, and I talked with psychiatrists about him and, and all of this, and I'd understood that he was bipolar, I'd understood that he was a malignant narcissist. 
And you've all put in front of me the 18 traits of the Bayer Fedio categorization of um, temporal lobe epilepsy, what, what used to be called Dostoevsky syndrome. And sure enough, 17 of them I was able to tick off immediately. It took me half an hour to find the 18th. And you don't need them all to have it. Curiously, Yuval did a, a piece with Chris Shelton. And uh, he was contacted by a former professor of neurology um, at an Ivy League university um, who said that he'd not told anybody, but for 30 years he'd been fascinated by Ron Hubbard. And he'd collected all of this material privately about Ron Hubbard. And he said he was there when Baird and Fedio gave their first lecture in, I think, 1977, about time, and he'd never connected it. And he'd said to you, Val, you're absolutely right. So realizing that, that the cult leader is a helpless mess, you know, they're people who are, you know, have to be, as with any narcissist, I, I'm very big on Eric Fromm's original definition of the malignant narcissist in it's a book called The Heart of Man, published in 1965, from which the narcissistic personality disorder um, in DSM-5 in 2012 comes. And he puts forward this idea, he, he says, Freud was wrong. Narcissism um, is not the inability to love others. It's the inability to love. And mm. curiously, Havelock Ellis, who was the first psychologist to use the term narcissism, used it accurately. Freud didn't. And the accurate description, and now the words change its meaning, is somebody who doesn't want to have sex with anyone but themselves. That's true narcissism. That's somebody who's looking into the you know, the, the, the mirror of the pond in front of them and adulating themselves. Now, what we call narcissists aren't doing that. And what Crom points out is they're people who've never devel developed a self, talks about them having a pseudo self. And he puts forward the idea that about 60% of people never develop a self. And that's a sobering thought, which is to say we don't grow up. You know, we, we don't become adult in the world. And it will always mean that there's the, the need for somebody else to tell you that you're all right, to tell you that, you know, you're wearing the right shirt or you've got the right kind of car or, you know, you're eating the right diet or what have you. Everything comes from the outside. And with cult leaders, that's all there is. They need the adulation. They're desperate to be regarded as gods, you know, as wonderful people. Then, of course, when you get close to them, you find out that they are tremendously flawed people. You know, they're, you know the ones I've looked at are, and, and that's quite a lot by now, they're frequently ill. They have bad tempers. They're domineering. Um, and they are vulnerable. So that if something goes wrong, uh, badly wrong, they collapse. So I know with, with Ron Hubbard, I interviewed people who'd been with him you know, actually right back to his, his birth. And this characteristic of depression, of, of self-loathing. So in private, so in 1950, when he was, he bigamously married his second wife, he was living with another woman and he actually proposed and took a marriage license out for another one, we found out just a couple of weeks ago. Um, mm -hmm. the, the woman he was living with, his girlfriend, Barbara Cloden, uh, said, uh, who later became a psychologist, she said that he ha would spend days in bed sobbing and, you know, drinking whiskey and hoping that something, some idea would pop up that he could write down and get some more followers with. And I talked with somebody who nursed him in 72, 73. Same thing, that he would go into this despair. Um, Lawrence Wright, who wrote Going Clear, interviewed a guy called Serge Fouth, sorry, Sir, yeah, Serge Fouth, who was with Hubbard at the end. And Hubbard said to him, I fail completely. I've achieved nothing. None of this works. So that, you know, and they don't care about other people. That there's no expression of love. You're told in your group that everybody loves you in the group and, and every, you know, they're all your friends. But the first point where you criticize the group in any way, you're ostracized, you're gone. So it's, 
there's nothing true in there. It's not really friendship. It it's it's not care of any kind. Next. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think question. Cheryl had some questions. I think Cheryl wanted to write them. Yeah, okay. and I'll, I'll read it out just so it's good for the recording and everything. <clears throat> if people uh, if people join a cult later in life, do they join a free will? Well, do, do we have free will? Um, I, I was asked this. I was um, that I did a what's it called the um, the nature of existence. It's a documentary called The Nature of Existence, made by this brilliant documentary maker, Roger Nygaard. And he he called me up in oh, 2007 or something, 2008, and said, would I give him an interview? And I said, no, I'm not talking about Scientology anymore. And he said, I don't want to talk to you about Scientology. I read your book and here's my project. Yeah. I've been around the world. I'm interviewing 200 people. In, I've interviewed 200 people. And I'm just, I've interviewed rabbis. I've interviewed um gurus in india I've, I've been to taiwan and talked to Taoists. i've talked to priests in the vatican but i've also talked to atheists uh, richard dawkins was next on the list after me um and physicists what is the nature of existence and i have a set list of questions and i ask the same questions and so and i won't be asking about scientology he did try and sneak in some questions about scientology actually and i just ignored them but otherwise he asked me this same list of questions and one of them was do we have free will and i can't say that i'd thought about you know i i think we and i said to him i don't think we do but i think we can get it and i think that's what the process of having a self becoming a self is where you develop your own volition your own it's not really the word free is redundant your own will and and what happens yeah absolutely in, in joining a group as opposed to being born into a group um your volition is taken over and you're led to believe that that your perception and interpretation of the world is inferior to that of the cult leader and they can let you in on these great truths um that's a deception but you know we I, I certainly, I was 19 when I got into Scientology. I certainly believed it all thoroughly for nine years. Um, I had no doubt about Ron Hubbard or about Scientology. I had a lot of doubts about the organization you know, and all the people in sailor suits and the huge, you know, when I joined, the auditing was six pounds an hour, you know, about eight dollars an hour. By the time I left nine years later, it was 120 pounds an hour. And one of the things that caused me to leave was that my, um, my first wife uh, took the registrar sales course. And this was material we'd never seen as Scientologists showing you how when they sit down and hard sell you the things they're doing. Like, for example, they're recording the session and there's somebody in the next room listening. I'd never been told that and it sounds criminal to me. And they would then tag team. That person would come in at the appropriate moment. They'd keep a folder of your buttons, the things you liked and disliked, so that you could be manipulated into your fear of worsening, as I would put it. And that really shocked me that I thought I'd been involved with this wonderful, compassionate movement and to find out that it was utterly manipulative. You know, so that was part of my route out. Have I, um, I had a question? Quick... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to ask him. I've come across this. It's not necessarily my situation, but I've come across others who, I guess you call it cult hopping. Oh yes. And I wondered briefly if you wanted to discuss what what your thoughts are on that. Mm. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a really important topic. The the first time I I went to the U.S. in 1986. I was shocked by this phenomenon that that I, I gave a talk and there were lots of people there who had actually they were into channeling was very popular uh, Ramtha Dr Peebles 
And, you know, Dr. Peebles was giving statements about Aaron <laughs> Hubbard. And there is the manipulator and the manipulated. They are two sides of the same coin. And um, he was apparently somewhere off in space. And it certainly sounded that way. And it amazed me, at, you know, just how willing people were. I, I knew a, a guy with a master's from Yale who'd been in Scientology for 20 years or something. And he got into Santeria. You know, so and I've got nothing against voodoo or, or Santeria. I, I don't, you know, they're religions. If people want to do that to chickens, I, you know, oh, I don't know. But it's probably not as bad as KFC in the long run, you know, for the chickens. But um, I, there was a guy, uh, Mark Jones, who'd been, uh, he'd commanded a wing of the US Air Force in, in Korea. Um, and therefore committed war crimes as far as I'm concerned, but we won't get into that. He was a, a, a very bright guy. And he again had been, a, he'd known her, but he was a huge advocate of Scientology. And then he's in Santeria. He's like, you know, we're doing voodoo ceremonies to, to make things happen. So I think, it, or, you know, one of my great friends, um, Mary Sylvie Patterson, um, when she left Scientology, she met my business partner um mitch on the street and she said i'm into this wonderful thing i'm into color therapy all you have to do is eat food that's the right color and so mitch who is an incredibly sensible human being said so food dye that would be the way to uh, make yourself perfectly healthy just color all your food blue or what have you wow it, yeah it's it and it's so difficult because we're trying to answer an urge inside ourselves to understand the world and what's going on in it as i say i'm an agnostic i've given up on that um uh and and feel very comfortable and very happy i must say at the age of 68. um but that you know that need that you know why is the world so crazy why is the world so unfair why are these awful things happening and i i mean not, i before I, I came to Scientology from uh, Soto Zen Buddhism for, for a year, I was practicing Soto Zen, um, which I believe is a cult, um, sure. certainly in the form that it came to the West through G.U. Kennett, which is the Mount Shasta group and Throstlehold Priory in this country. Um, but I, you know, it was useful to me. It was, you know, I, and throughout Scientology and for many years beyond, probably till somewhere about 10 years ago, so into my 50s. I would have, you know, I didn't belong to a Buddhist group, but I would have said, yeah, essentially I'm a Buddhist. And then one day the whole concept of enlightenment collapsed for me. You know, this, this idea that I could have this serene state where, you know, nothing would trouble me anymore. And I realized it was fear. I realized that I wanted to be in a bliss state so that I wouldn't get upset because what had propelled me into Scientology is, you know, I'm an empath. I'm, I have very powerful emotional responses. And, and when my girlfriend ran away to New Zealand with one of my friends, I got really upset. And there was nothing, you know, in the society around me that, that was helpful. And I found a copy of Science of Survival by Ron Hubbard, which promised me all of these things in a relatively sensible way. I eventually met the man who wrote the book. It wasn't Ron Hubbard, it was a man called Richard DeMille, um, yes. who was the son of Cecil B. DeMille. Uh, mm -hmm. He was actually his blood nephew and adopted, but then became a professor of psychology later on. But this, was, this didn't have any of the reincarnation. It didn't have any of the spiritual stuff. And it was just what appeared to be a practical therapy. And of course, none of it was, was still in use in Scientology because every six months, for the first 15 years, Hubbard changed everything. So you've got all of this redundant material. That's, you, you have to read all of the books, as you know. Um, yes, many times over. <laughs> yeah, and, and you don't use anything in them. I've, you know, a Not few really. weeks ago, I, I, I reread uh, Fundamentals of Thought, Problems of Work, Scientology 8.80, and Scientology 8.8008. Because um, I, it, Andrew Gold had asked me to if I could do something about well I'd said to him look let's do something about the crazy things in Scientology everybody talks about Xeno and the body thetans and we're evolved from clams there is so much more you know okay. and so it 
it didn't take me any time to read them. Uh, I read History of Man to do a show with Mike Rinder. And Mike couldn't believe I'd actually read the book so we could talk about it. And that was the first time I'd read a Scientology book since I left. Mm -hmm. And I'd got them marked up well enough to have quotations to use in what I was doing. And it was really weird going back and reading these books and going, this is absolute nonsense. And returning to the point about beliefs, if you go back to some of the material of the group, you know, one of the books, and now look at it paragraph by paragraph and say, is that true? And you can tick the ones that are true. And then you can go, ah, this is somebody who's trying to get me to worship them. And I mean, my own thing with, with the idea of divinity is, I wouldn't worship anyone or anything that wanted to be worshipped. It's pretty simple, that one. And that one I got when I was 13 years old. You know, and I, I stopped believing in a personification of God, let's put it that way. You know, I, I think if there is something, it's a lot more profound than that. Um, but you go through the material and does it still make sense to you? And what will start to happen usually is you will burst out laughing. Oh. There will come a point where, you, you know, where Ron Hubbard says, you know, this is the first great idea in 50,000 years of thinking men. And you go, yeah, really? Um, <laughs> and, it, you know, he, he says that he's done uh, 80,000 hours of research. And you say, OK, 40 hours a week, that's 40 years. And he was 43 when he said it something like that you know so he'd been at it since he was three years old um and not done anything else you know so you start finding the exaggerations the hyperbole um the contradictions that you know, yes, when i've really. helped people to leave it's always been through contradiction and it must be a contradiction in the leader's own teaching so with ron hubbard that's really easy and yet when we believed we didn't notice did we you know, there he is saying that he was crippled and blinded at the end of World War II. But elsewhere, he says on July the 25th, 1945, and the war ended, I think, on August 14th or 15th, depending which side of the dateline you were. But on July 25th, he was in Hollywood and he beat up three petty officers. Right. Now, when I put that to a, a Scientologist one time, he said, yeah, well, that's easy. He had two bodies. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. And then when I said he didn't see combat in World War II, I've, I've read all 800 pages of his Navy record twice. Um, and I've seen testimony by an officer who served with him and, and what have you. He didn't, did not see combat, crippled and blinded. And she looked at me and she said, yes, he did. I said, well, how do you know that? She said, I was with him. And I didn't have the presence of mind to say, what were you called? What was the name of the ship? Where were you? because then she'd have got into a certain amount of trouble. It's like the whole thing about past lives in Scientology, that if you sit down with a Scientologist and they say, oh yeah, I was at the Battle of Agincourt on the French side, you say, well, speak some medieval French then. You know, just a couple of sentences will do. And nothing, not ever. I've, I've interviewed more than a thousand ex-members of Scientology and no one has ever come up with credible evidence for their past lives. They wish to believe that, that's fine. But that's the other thing that I came to after Scientology was I want evidence now. I, I know we have these feelings of knowing and something feels right. You know, um, I did a, a show about uh, my late friend Jolly West was accused of having programmed the Manson family, which started me on a journey in May where I'm now been commissioned to write a book about Manson and Manson's involvement with Scientology, which was profound. He spent 14 months studying Scientology. Nobody in 54 years has brought this out. It's mentioned in passing as if Scientology was something you believe rather than a set of control techniques. But so I said, you know, well, this guy, Tom O'Neill and his book Chaos, he says that all he can prove is, is that Jolly West and Charles Manson were both at some time in the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic. They walked the same corridors. I'm kind of going, that's not really good enough evidence to say he programmed the Manson family for the next two and a half years. He can't even show that he ever met Manson or any of the others. Nonetheless, in the comments, lots of people are going, ah, oh, 
you must be working for the CIA, you know. Can't you see that Jolly West must have been working on MK Ultra and all this? We go with our beliefs. We go with what we feel. And I think we should attend to our intuition, our instincts, our beliefs, but we should then verify them with rational thought. And mm -hmm. that makes life a lot, I find it makes life a lot easier generally. Hi, I have a question, John. Um, when you're like just getting out of these situations and this, um, I've been in a, a rabid rampant of reading, watching, listening, and just like this whole van of information is, is in my head. And I keep on like um, jumping around on topics and it's like, oh, I need to work on that. That, that. that is something that needs to be addressed. Nobody knows about this topic. Nobody knows about this other topic. There are so many. So how, because I can, I can read your structure while you're like throughout your books, you are very structured in your, in your um, um, like, um, discernment and the, the way you uh, approach the topics. It, it's very well organized. How did you reach that part, like organizing this chaos? I, I, I think the, I think the difference, I, I dropped out of school when I was 17. And that was the, you know, I, I spent a couple of years in art college, but you can hardly call that a, an education. It's great fun. Um, and I find it very difficult to do as I'm told. So Scientology was not a great place for me. Um, I, you know, it, it, when I was at school, the, as I say, when I was 13, I stopped believing in, in the Christian faith. And the way that came about was because in the school, we were being told you've got to follow Jesus, you know, that's, that's the important thing. And you've also got to be incredibly rich and powerful. You know, and these two things were coming alongside each other. And I, I thought, I think I, I had no idea that, that I was in any way clever. Um, you know, I had, bro had three older brothers, they were clever. And nobody particularly respected my intellect, which was good. I think it was very useful. You know, the smugness came later for me. Um, but it meant that I thought there must be something wrong with my thinking. I must be too simple to understand these things, which of course is a fundamental aspect of cult involvement that when the gobbledygook comes out from the cult leader, you go, well, when I'm at a higher level of achievement, I'll understand this. So I think the first part is, is what I, what I had at school and what is, I fear drummed out of people in our educational system was curiosity. And I felt that it was all right to ask questions and I would be sent to the back of the class <laughs> from time to time because I'd, I'd ask awkward questions just because they were what occurred to me. So that part is natural. Becoming systematic, um, you know, when I, when I wrote what's now let's sell these people a, a piece of blue sky it was published in 1990 um, and I worked on it for six years and the, the original book was about the explosion of Scientology it was about what had happened be between 1982 and 1984 with about half of the membership leaving uh, and it was particularly about Captain Bill Robertson who I came to know well and who was a complete lunatic and well-meaning and destructive as complete lunatics often are. Um, and I, that was what the original book was. It was Scient the Scientology war and it was just about that. And then I looked at it and went, nobody's going to understand this. They have to understand what Scientology is. So it was then, you know, well, historically, what is Scientology? And then it was, well, nobody's going to understand that without understanding who Ron Hubbard was. And so it, it becomes almost habitual, you know, so the first thing to do was, was where are the biographies of Hubbard? What did Hubbard say about himself? And I found 22. And then I put them all together. I used the one from Mission Into Time, um, which is allegedly written by the editors, but the book is copyrighted to Aaron Hubbard. And 
wherever there was a contradiction, you know, I put in the contradictions and no two stories were the same. It, you know, so he was a blood brother of the Blackfoot Pikuni people uh, at the age of two or at the age of four or at the age of six. And the next step is, you know, the Pikuni didn't recognize that at all. In fact, I'm led to believe that no Native American people ever had blood brothers. It was something that was invented in the 20s and 30s in Hollywood and taken from the Vikings, who apparently did cause blood diseases to transmute in this way. Um, and the Pakuni have actually, their historian has said, you know, we, we never had blood brothers and no, he wasn't one. But so, and collecting every document and the way that I, I brought it together was, was in a chronology, which using Hubbard's own expression, I called the time track. And by saying, here's the date, this is, these are the words used in the description in the book or whatever that I've read. And I created that chronology. It, it ultimately, um, a friend took it over, but he took it to 600 pages. And so it, it's, it's being systematic. It's assembling information and then having to determine you know, which parts of this information are important. And in looking at a cult, it's the contradictions. It's the lies, um, the things that cannot possibly be true. So, and beyond that, I think it's simply that I'm really curious. I'm really fascinated by the world around me and I can't keep up. You know, it, there are so many subjects that engross me. You know, if you, you know, I, my CD collection now runs to about 3,000 discs and it starts with Hildegard von Bingen in the 12th century and comes up to things that, that have been released in the last year or so. So I listen to swing, I listen to blues, I love Sibelius and Stravinsky. It's impossible to keep up because I find the world fascinating and wonderful. And, um, you know, the same with literature, you know, one day I will read the other Dostoevsky novels. At the moment I'm actually, uh, I read, I watched three documentaries about Agatha Christie and I've never read an Agatha Christie book. My mom did, but I, you know, I know them from adaptations, Murder on the Orient Express, Murder on the Nile, Murder Here, There and Everywhere. But I saw these documentaries made by an English historian called Lucy Worsley and found out that she'd published six novels under a different name, Mary Westmacott. And this happened because in 1926, she disappeared and the largest manhunt in British history set out to find her. And she said, that she had amnesia. When they were found, she said she hadn't, couldn't remember that she was Agatha Christie and people didn't believe her. And she went then and had therapy from a man called William Brown, who was a hypnotist and highly celebrated doctor. The curiosity is that the therapy he used would be something that Ron Hubbard would pick up. And he actually abandoned it when he was commissioned to write and excuse me, Dianetics, the Mental Science of Modern Health, as I like to think of it, when he was commissioned to write it, and it took six weeks to write, he turned to the guy who was with him, who I interviewed back in the 80s, and said, um, oh, deep transhypnosis isn't popular anymore. We'll have to come up with a new method. And but the method he used was William Brown's method. So suddenly there's this thing. So I, I find myself, I've just finished one of the Mary Westmacott novels and I'm reading another one. I, I bounce around all over the place and I can't keep up with myself fundamentally. <laughs> so it's being interested and, and having the, the courage of your own convictions and and going, yeah, it's all right for you to follow your own nose. It's all right for you to break off and go and look at something else. Um, I think that study that is directed from the outside, you know, I have a, a brother who, who got a master's at MIT. He's brilliant. And about 30 years ago, he said how much he resented me because I found it so easy to learn. And I had to point out to him that he'd learned lots of things that he didn't want to learn. Mm. and been successful. I cannot do that. 
I don't have that kind of mind. If, if I'm not interested in it, I won't learn it. So, you know, and again, that's part of becoming a self. You know, what is it that interests you? You know, as Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. Yeah, and that's what we spent the last five weeks really celebrating with opening our minds is how much was synthesized in. <clears throat> so now I'll clear my throat and go for the pushback, the big thing that um, I didn't like that was new to me. And so challenge time at you, John. Great. Uh, there was a, I had noted down the relaxation induced anxiety. Mm. And I hadn't heard of that prior to your book and um, anything you can direct me to, I'll take. But at at first, yeah, that just, I kind of get it, but it, it, it rubbed me an interesting way because relaxation induced anxiety didn't it didn't compute for me entirely like well the whole point of relaxation is to relax and to get anxiety so um could you talk a little bit more about that i i just got back from a month in india and i was calm i was thinking to myself how high strong westerners are so um yeah i'd love to i'd love to dive into that with you for a little bit yeah for sure um it's a long time since i read it and i can't point to the source but um i read that about 40 percent of people if they meditate, will suffer from relation, uh, relaxation-induced anxiety. And uh, I was told about it in Zen Buddhism when I was 18, um, that for some people, you have to actually get towards meditation. And for some people, that means exercising before they meditate. Um, Jiu Kennett, who founded the British Zen cult, um, said that, that she found it was best to have a to bathe you know to lie in a bath before she meditated um i'm not sure she was allowed to do that in the 10 years she was in zen monasteries probably not she was probably hit with a zen stick you know um so it it's a physiological condition at the extreme um yeah, the book mindfulness by professor robert purser i think is is very interesting in terms of of meditation. Now, Purser is a meditator. He's a lifelong meditator who is criticizing the mindfulness movement, as I frequently do. Um, um, there is a tiny percentage of people who can actually have a psychotic break through meditating and have never had mm -hmm. such an experience before. And I think it's to do with um, th the way our attention works, and it's different from one person to the next. So, I mean, I found meditation incredibly useful. Um, and I suppose I've stopped doing it because, you know, the aim of meditation in Buddhism is one pointedness of mind, being able to concentrate. And I came to the point where I could do that. And so, and I was taught again in, in Zen that you only meditate so that you can come to a state where you can concentrate. However, I don't want to be in that state all the time uh mm. it's not useful i i've interviewed people who are in transcendent that transcendental meditation uh who would spend 12 hours a day meditating their children would run wild their job would be abandoned and they wanted the bliss state they wanted the bliss state so it's good to calm down it's good to relax but temperamentally we're different so for some people they can sit and look at a wall um watch the pretty colors floating down it, because that's what your brain does. It's called the Gansfeld effect. And it's perfectly natural. And people think, you know, this is one of the way that cults work by selling you the idea that you've had a spiritual experience, or in fact, you've had a physiological experience. And any fixation of perception, um, any repetition, and mimicry, they're all things that can lead to the Gansfeld effect and the brain going, uh, I'm not getting enough stimulation. I, I need something else. And people will hallucinate. Um, if you sit in a darkened room, completely dark room, within 10 minutes, there are two things that will happen. One is you'll start to hear things that aren't happening. And the other is you'll think there are things moving in the room. You know? So, Getting somebody into a straight state of extreme relaxation can cause anxiety. 
if it doesn't, if that doesn't happen to you, that's fine. You know, it's just the problem in the mindfulness movement is, you know, if, if you do Buddhist meditations and, and I have a lot of questions about the people in Buddhism now, I'm, I'm not at all happy with, with some, with some of the sects and what they do. And I don't believe the fundamental idea that we're all suffering. You know, I, I, I'm not, <laughs> you know, some of the time I'm really quite pleased, you know, um, and I don't believe that, that when I die, I'm, I could enter Nirvana or anything like that. I, I can't be bothered. I, I take the view of Jiang Su, the, the Chinese philosopher, who said, I don't know where I was before I was born. I don't know where I go after I die. It's this that matters. It's doing this. And so, you know, as a Buddhist, I had what's called the fear of the eternal return. You get into Scientology and you're told that reincarnation is this great thing. I'll be able to do it in my next life which actually leads to the incredibly high suicide rate in Scientology, where people think, well, I'll just have another life. And that's not really a safe bet, as far as I can tell. And so I came to Scientology, you know, the idea, of, of course, in Buddhism and, and in Hinduism, is that you're getting off the wheel of suffering. You are ceasing to exist. You are understanding that you have no self, anatta. And so I had that throughout Scientology, while other people were like, oh, well, past lives, I'll have another life, it'll be great. I had the, the, the most terrifying thought to me was the thought of living forever, you know. Um, really, you know, I, I can remember having palpitations over it once. Um, and with that dissipating and, and coming to a, a different um, belief, realization however we want to look at it of the world that there, there is this this transformation and in looking back at buddhism yes people who've grown up meditating with meditation as part of their lifestyle within a community where meditation is commonplace will understand that things can go wrong and when they yeah. do go wrong the buddhists will have some approach to that. In mindfulness, they'll just throw you out, just like any other cult. They'll say, you're not doing it right. So, um, yeah. Uh, or, or even worse, the TMers who say meditate more. People have, in the, I was reading, I forget which book, but yeah, you know, oh, you're not meditating enough. It's like, yeah, yeah which is just horrifying. Yeah. yeah. And you're trying to get into, a, I think of, you know, again, there are two forms of meditation that, that, one of the forms is is to in, induce a hypnotic state through repetition. So the TM meditation is the recitation of, of a, a name, which they will call a mantra. I'm not sure that that's accurate, but it's the name of a demon or deity. Um, and by repeating that over and over, I think the poet Wordsworth pointed out, if you repeated your own name, you go into this repetition of anything and that's one of the states you can get into from meditation. And that may be useful to some people that, that they, it tunes everything else out for a little while and then they can come back. It's when you don't come back. The other form of meditation, and there was an experiment done many years ago where most of the early experiments on meditation, um, say the um, relaxation response, uh, Herbert Benson, he tried to validate TM and they wouldn't tell him what the mantras were because they're a secret. And so he just had people say the word one to themselves and he found that they got exactly the same response. And the, the thing there is, so that became, you'd get novices, you'd sit them down, they'd meditate, you'd do, you know, electroencephalographs or whatever to see what was going on. And Nobody thought for a while to, to get really practiced meditators. So I think one of the first studies was with um, was a French guy, he's a PhD who studied with the Dalai Lama for many years. And seems like, uh, uh, Matthew Ricard, seems like a really good guy. I'm not into Tibetan Buddhism. I'm really not into Tibetan Buddhism. Um, it's such a mixture of the Bonpo magical ideas, you know, I don't want to drink out of a human skull. You know, it just, I don't know, it could just be me. Um, 
<laughs> uh, but Matthew Ricard was was tested, and they found that that he didn't have um, the surprise responses that were, were held to be inherent in all of us. That when there was a sudden noise in the environment, he didn't jump. So he seemed to be in a have a different consciousness, whether that's a good thing or not. But also in in testing a, a Zen meditator, a, a practice Zen meditator against. Um, meditators from other schools it was found that if you rang a little bell then every time you did it the response was less and less and less in the other group but the zen meditator had the same response to it every time so that's a form of meditation that's headed towards awareness as opposed to the internalization of, of mantra meditations and things like that and it may or may not be useful depending upon your temperament and that's a decision we make <clears throat> you, I studied, I, I was three days in a Zen monastery when I was 18, um, up in the north of England. And um, I'd gone there intending to be there for six months. But after three days, I decided to leave. And it was a very sensible decision. You know, I felt weak and, you know, all of that, you know, I felt bad about doing it. But I'd had such a profound experience meditating, I needed to go away and digest it. And, you know, it was useful to me. If I'd stayed there, I think things would have gone from bad to worse. Um, so how much meditation you do, what type of meditation you do. And, you know, yeah, make some people anxious and they may be able to get over it by going and having a run and then meditating. It may just be they've got so much pent up energy. Uh, they may have a bath and relax that way and be able to meditate. Or it may not be the thing for them. I personally don't recommend fixed meditation. I I tend more towards the Taoist way of you lie down rather than sitting up. I think straight back sitting is is difficult for Westerners. Um, you know, and by the time you're adult, you're probably not going to be able to do it comfortably. Least of all a lotus position. You know, ever thought of that? But the Taoists lie down to meditate. They lie on their sides. I lie on my back. There's a pillow under my head, three pillows under my knees, so I'm in a position where I won't cramp. And then I listen to music. I listen to Renaissance polyphony or Indian classical music. So there's something changing in the environment. And I'll usually look at a painting while I'm doing it. And I think the most important part of meditation is the breathing. I think that if we learn to breathe deeply and slowly, not holding a breath, breathing on the wheel, as Buddhists call it, then that, it, it lowers our uh, anxiety responses, our cortisol production, it, and allows us to, you know, settle down all of the chatter in our minds. Um, and it's, you know, it's about as mystical as, as I get, having spent a lifetime studying religion and mysticism. Okay. Take a deep breath. Yes. Do you have any other challenges? That didn't seem like a p particularly harsh challenge. Have you got something a bit more ferocious? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I was so indoctrinated, not the challenge, that that was actually bold and my heart was beating away. So, uh, oh. but, okay. <laughs> well, let me um, tell you that one of the things that, that I've come to love is cognitive dissonance. I hmm. like to be challenged. As long as people are friendly about it, it gives us the chance to discuss something. I, and the, hmm. Yeah, you know, having people sitting around just agreeing with me is is boring, you know. So sure. it, you know, you you can you, you obviously got relaxation induced anxiety about asking me the question. What can I say? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, um, a little bit of a challenge then to circle back to the top of the conversation. There was a note in the chat, um, and just uh, to give your experience of how people are when they come out. Uh, that was the question, if you could give your experience, but I'll up that a little bit because you mentioned like helping 600 people out. And I like your challenge of when you, well, who did you challenge there? Hoyt. 
and that, that idea that it takes a long time to heal. Um, so can you share a little bit about, for us kind of newbies, ways to accelerate our healing um, while you talk about, you know, the experience of people that just get out of the cult. And I know, you know, they're working with someone to help them out. So yeah, if you could um, elaborate on that a little bit, your 40 years, what we can be doing here in Ed Cares Group to help accelerate our mm-hmm. healing. I appreciate that. Of course. Um, the first thing is to separate out the, the idea of intervention where you're helping somebody to leave a group and there aren't many people who can do that. Um, you know, my friend Steve Hassan or, or Joe Zimhart, um, uh, Joe Kelly, Pat Ryan, that there are people who are very good at that. And then there are people who work with recovery. And the, the longest I've worked with somebody was 35 years. And he, if, you know, his situation was that he was sexually abused when he was 15 by a teacher who then used Ron Hubbard's Dianetic Therapy to run out the trauma. And it took 35 years from our first meeting to the point where, you know, and this is not done as therapy sessions, these are conversations when the person wants to come and talk to me and there'd be years between where we didn't meet or, you know, somebody will write me an email or a letter. And eventually after 35 years, he went, it's nonsense. Um, it was another guy, profoundly clever man who was really committed to the most absurd ideas in Scientology uh, and indeed followed Captain Bill Robertson, who was even more absurd. And it took seven years of conversation. Um, But I gradually got better at it. And so in recovery, the first thing is when you leave the group, you're a 12 year old. That's, that's the state of maturity that you've been reduced to. So you are on the verge of puberty. And what will happen is you want to rebel. You want to, you know, with Scientology, my, my friends, well, my male friends would grow beards and grow their hair and they'd smoke dope, you know, because that was forbidden in, in Scientology. So you get this kind of period of rebellion and that's okay. You know, do things for yourself. Do things that please you. Um, and there's a balance in recovery, which is that, uh, you know, a lot of people working, you know, I, I think Janja Lelich would probably say it. I, I think her, um, the book with Madeline Tobias, Take Back Your Life, um, is extremely useful. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to divide your time so that they're, in the period after leaving, there'll be an obsession with understanding what you're involved with. And it's a good idea to split your time in half. Spend half of your time finding out about cults and, and your group spend the other half of your time doing something you like doing. You like going swimming, go swimming. You like playing the guitar, play the guitar, listening to music, whatever it is, painting pictures, reading Agatha Christie novels. Um, (laughs) But do things for yourself. I mean, it is the locus of control. That's the most important idea, I think, that who's in control of you. And it's not just, you know, that's the boon of having been a cult member that you've given over control of yourself so much to another person you've got much more chance than most people of gaining control of yourself you know and there are two elements i think to that the first of them is humility um being willing to be wrong being willing to accept that you were wrong and you know not having too too big an idea of yourself but not having too little an idea of yourself. Um, And the other is compassion, which means to feel with somebody. We've moved it away really from from that. But to understand that everybody in the world has to go through these questions and these problems. And you either never ask the questions and you'll live and die that way. And, you know, if you're in a, a third world country, 
or in a country that's oppressed, you may never be able to do more than live hand to mouth. You may never have the luxury of thinking about the spiritual verities. But in in a Western, in the for the most part in Western society, having said that, of course, the U.S. has twenty five percent of its people below the poverty level, and the U.K. has twenty percent. So it's not true even here. But if you do, if you can think about who you are and what you are, then you need to do that. And you need to arrive at conclusions that are suitable to you and to your mentality. And I would say that that's where compassion becomes the significant element. Um, that if you understand that everybody is on the journey, everybody is trying to work out how it is, and while there are people who, like me, <laughs> may claim they've worked it out for themselves to a point where they're happy, but that's also because of the love I have for my children. That's also because of the love I have for my wife. Because my transition was from wanting to be enlightened to realizing that I never will be, <laughs> to going, ah, the most important thing in human life is relationship. And for most of, it's, most of us, it's relationship to other people. So that at those moments of loss and catastrophe that I was trying to avoid by being enlightened, and I have to accept they will happen, there'll be people there who will help me. And in return, what's necessary is that I express my compassion and my love by being here to help other people and by, by having, you know, by being trustworthy, by being honest, by being honorable. By, by going for those things rather than enlightenment or saintliness, which, which I'm mm. never going to achieve. Um, so, yeah, in so the process of recovery, do things that, that you enjoy. Um, seek pleasure, you know, eat, eat, eat chocolate, but make sure it's really good chocolate. You know, chocolate's good for you. It's the sugar that's bad for you. Um, do things that you enjoy, but I make a differentiation between pleasure and happiness. Pleasure is that I will reward myself. You know, I had a mug of cocoa when we started, and you know what could be better than that? The the food of the gods, the obromine. Um, those little things are great, but I realise that my happiness absolutely depends on the feeling that I've done something useful in the world. So. 20 years ago, I, I had a letter and uh, it started, um, you won't remember me. And she was right. And that's, I have no idea who this woman is. <laughs> but 15 years ago, I spent an afternoon with you and my life was in ruins because of Scientology. And that was the point where everything started to turn around. I have a happy marriage, I have children, and I have a good career. And I attribute it to that turning point. And when somebody says something like that to you, or they say, as you said, that you know, your book was useful to me, that's happiness. That's the point yes. where, yeah, it's, it's worthwhile. It's, it's a joy being alive. So look towards that, you know, and which you're doing. You're a group of people working together um and and sharing and and getting stronger getting better um because you know i read your little message on the, the thing because you're mm. you're seeking to um to help each other you're seeking to be good people and as long as you don't let somebody into your group who's destructive and um, you probably will recognize that now a lot more quickly <laughs> than most people that's the goal yes. yeah. so yeah yeah. Great. Thank you. Any last questions from anyone else? Um, that's a wonderful ending point, but I want to open it up uh, mm -hmm. for anyone else. I have a couple of questions, but they're more in the in the theoretical part, like uh, on the on the definition and the construction of, of identity, how the definitions from Fromm and from Freud are, are being read and understood. I have I have different opinion and and I can back it up <laughs> about the Freudian definition of narcissism and stuff, but I don't think if this would be the space to, to, to bring them up. 
I think it would. <laughs> I, I'd yeah. be I'd be yeah. fascinated because I think you you hit the nail on the head. What we mean by identity, what we mean by personality, what we mean by the self, these are the essential questions. I mean, Steve Hassan um, in Combating Cult Mind Control puts forward the idea that you have the, the cult identity and the authentic identity. So you have John Cult. I don't know why he decided to call it John, <laughs> but he does, does have an H in it and I don't. We couldn't afford one. Um, but then I... I look at that and I go, no, that that's not how it works. You know, it's not you're going to return to who you were. You're going to actually consolidate who you are. You're so, and I think that identity, uh, there's a kind of fluid core of identity, and then there are strands. So that I, I mean, I say in opening our minds that there's kind of X Y axis that mm -hmm. you know the mood you're in and the person you're talking to and that you can plot how you'll respond so how you talk to your pet or how you talk to your parent or your boss or, or you know somebody who's come to fix your car those will be different it doesn't mean that you know there's any kind of dissociative identity disorder going on i mean martha stout argues that we all suffer from this and that's i just think that's nonsense um but all of the strands that come together, I, I think, are really important. So tell me that you're, you're thinking about Freud, about From, about narcissism and fascinating. Yeah, so um, I would throw in uh, another element, not only identity, but also identification and how mm. the formats of identification are going to um, construct the way in which objects, like, like uh, relationships are um embedded how we internalize those objects of of of, of emotion the, the objects outside how they are internalized and how they are lived through different processes and what i found out like reading is that the the process of identification when a person is in a cultic situation or in a narcissistic relationship uh, uh, high demand, high control relationship, yep. just to, to leave the narcissistic uh, word out a little bit, would be through a uh, form of melancholy in, in the sense of, of uh, appropriating uh, the identity of the other, which is not self, which is not completely structured. Mm -hmm. It is narcissistically structured in, in, in which it, was not consolidated and it was not um the 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 narcissist the antagonist person did not consolidate a an identity that was other than the infantile uh, the infantilized yep. one yep. and so in that uh melancholy uh process in that identification it's as if the 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 person who is in that situation absorbs the other and then yep. lives life through that other yes in in that sense that's that's and that comes from freud like that is not something that was uh, like i did not read it otherwise it's mm -hmm. something that freud states and 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 um i don't know the, the titles in in spanish but since introduction to narcissism from freud uh he starts stating all, all those mm -hmm. processes and um well, that's what I'm working with theoretically, and, and that's why I would contend and would question the use of the, the, the idea of narcissism in the plain outside day-to-day uh, -day usage. It's like, oh, everyone's narcissistic now, right? Yeah, it's, it's become a, a common term of abuse. And, and as I say, I, I, I don't like the redefinition that Freud gave to it. Um, because the story of Echo and Narcissus is not properly represented in Freud. But Freud doesn't use that. Well, why would you use the word Narcissus if you're not referring to Narcissus? He's, no, he's, he's referring it to it through the lens of the way the in, in, um, childhood development, the psyche of the child is structured and how uh, for a child, uh, he, he's everything. Like you see a little baby and, and that 
first stage of narcissism is like I'm everything. I'm mom. I'm dad. Everything that brings me pleasure is me. So in that sense, everything that is not pleasurable is not me, and that's bad, and I hate it. Yep. <laughs> right? And 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 that's the way it's it's structured in mm. Freud. I think it is read after Freud. Like we also have by beyond Bion. I don't know how to say it in English. <laughs> I'm talking about uh, Bion digesting uh, like emotions, and we have Klein, and we have Erickson, and we have all these other readings. Lacan, uh, Jacques Lacan, also uh, comes into work there. But I think like the the basis of melancholy to understand the process in which a person can be um, the the psyche of the person is. Um, like, it, because sometimes it sounds as if it's ripped out by another, mm. and it is. It is very concerning to me that the person is left with no agency. So, if if we're not left with any agency upon the manipulation of the of the person, um, sorry, my headset just went uh, oh, off. <laughs> sorry, but uh -huh. um. Then if there's no agency, there's no possibility of reclaiming or restructuring something personal because it's everything is out there. So I'm trying to look into a deeper sense or a more person-centered situation when cultic abuse, narcissistic abuse, antagonistic relationships occur. Okay. I, yeah. And I, I mean, I have fundamental disagreements with the Freudian construction. Uh, the first is the idea that libido or thanatos, as you know, Freud didn't like the word, but that, that we are driven by the desire for sex or the desire to kill ourselves. These two foundational axes. I don't think that's true. I also don't think it's true that between the age of one and one and a half, we want to have sex with the opposed parent to us. We, you know, I also think the seduction theory causes a terrible problem with, with Freudianism. Freud, of course, admitted in private letters that he believed that all infants seek to seduce their parents sexually. But he said that Ernest Jones has it in his biography of Freud, which is, of course, he was a adulated Freud. But there's the letter. And, and he's saying, well, I had to give up seduction theory because it's unpopular and people won't read the rest of my work. Jeffrey Masson, of course, working in the Freud archive, got into terrible trouble saying, you know, seduction theory is foundational to the Freudian idea, this idea of infantile libido. And Masson was vilified by the Freudian community to such an extent that he never again wrote about the subject, having taken a PhD, become oh, a yeah. Of all of it. Psychoanalysis is a cult. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and a cult derives from a set of beliefs. So the Freudian construction of identity, and I think what you're saying is fascinating, don't get me wrong, that how we form our identities, how we identify with others, and so therefore say this is what we want to become, but also this is what we have to become. You know, that to, to be, you know, I'm born into a Catholic family, I have to genuflect every time I go into the church, I have to cross myself and all of this. Because if I don't, you know, I'm going to be in big trouble. So I think, yeah, the complexity of, of it is, is fascinating. Um, and, and I can understand why, why you're thinking hard about it. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't have, you know, my own ideas about identity probably um, were most influenced by Jolly West, who I mentioned earlier, who wrote a paper in, I think about 1989 about identity and it it's such difficult words we use the word personality coming from persona meaning mask that we put on these different faces we put on these different types and i think the essential question having been involved in a cult is is this the mask i wish to wear is this the person i wish to be as opposed to is this a mask that's been imposed upon me? And of course, in many social situations, you will be very unpopular if you don't wear the right mask. And you know, being unpopular is good fun sometimes. So you know, it's not all bad. 
I've done quite a lot of it. Um, but, you know, work out who you are in whatever formulation and whatever terms. Um, and I would agree that, that yes, when, when we're born, we can only be aware of ourselves. But I think there's an error in thinking that how much awareness we have. It's very little. Until we're four or five years old and the, the neural connections are, are built. Exactly. There's very little self-perception, but there is just the sense of, you know, with my, I have four children and, and with all of them, um, watching them from birth onwards was just the most fascinating education to see, you know, they, they cry. After a few months, they learn how to smile and you have to keep changing their nappy and, and giving them milk. But it's a very simple process. Then somewhere around three months, they'll stop shaking all of their limbs when they're trying to reach something. And they'll reach with just, at about six months, they'll sit up at a, somewhere like a year. Girls are usually quicker than boys. They'll start to walk. And watching you know, a person come into being, that, that's a, just a, the most remarkable thing. I think we understand so little of, of that, you know, uh, John Bowlby's attachment mm -hmm. work. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I hesitated. I, I'm told that, that Bowlby's wife, when he was cast, you know, as he was rejecting Freud and working on this new idea, um, that he's, he, he was, well, what should I call it? And his wife said, you should call it love. And of course, Ferenzi was thrown out by Freud for, for using the word love. Um, we, we're not having any of that in our scientific construction. And instead, he chose the term attachment. Yeah. And that, of course, is fundamental to how identity forms. Did you have a secure attachment? Do you have a secure attachment now? Um, my friend Alex Stain, um, what's it called? Uh, got it down there. Uh, terror, love and brainwashing. And, and she did her PhD, having come out of a, a communist cult, a terrible group in America. Um, and, and she puts, she is very strong on the idea of disorganized attachment. That what happens in a cult group is that you now have the, you know, the hero figure, the, the cult leader, and the attachment will be that that's where you get your gratification from. That, that that's where comfort comes from but also this person will punish you so like the parent who says oh i love you i love you i love you come here slap you know um and i think that need for attachment you see i think attachment theory is very useful in looking at children but i think we have to be really careful in the adult world when we start applying what was found out about children because it, it's like that the whole thing of of you know, the, the, the transformation that's happened in evolutionary theory in the last 20 or 30 years, where the kind of Richard Dawkins, you've got natural selection, you've got sexual selection and the selfish gene. Um, he's still not really accepting epigenetics, which takes mm -hmm. us back to the kind of Lamarckian idea of evolution that in a single generation, a transformation can happen genetically that we passed on. And then you have that fourth dimension as Eva Yablonka says in her work, which is cultural um, transmission. So because we have language, because we don't have to rely on our own memories, we have libraries, <laughs> computer databases, we are able to actually, you know, all of this stuff that in the 90s that was so popular about chimps and bonobos, you know, do, do I hit it or do I have sex with it? You know, these are the two possibilities of human behavior. And kind of going, actually, it's completely irrelevant that we're related to chimps because we can evolve in a single generation because we have the means to, and we do. We can't help but change. For me, that transformed my spiritual understanding of the world and, and made me feel very satisfied that we're all therefore important. Everything we think and say and do, every one of us is important because it's another thread in the tapestry. You know, which is humanity, which is the, you know, the, the greater self, if you like, rather than, you know, we little individuals who want to live forever and light up the sky with our names. Um, that 
that you know there is there is something more there and you are so right the essential of that is identity who do i think i am how did i become this what are the strands of my identity and how does that transform i'm very aware you know because i've been writing since i was 13 and i've only ever thrown away one thing that i wrote um which was a two line rude poem that, that my second wife didn't like and and i memorized it so it's not lost um and um <clears throat> her lovers were a, a string of skinless sausages my wife told me that she'd only been with with men who been circumcised before so oh dear now i've made it public but other than that i've got everything i've ever written and it means i can go back and look at this drivel that that i've produced you know in such massive quantities and realize that i am a very different person now to the person i was when i was 13 23 33 43 anywhere on the line and that there's evolution there's this change now I'm lucky I've not suffered from any severe illness or disability. You know, I, um, when I've had to deal with death, it's been the death of, I had one friend who died at the age of 42, but I've been really lucky. You know, my parents, my dad got to 75, my mum to 94. Um, and my father-in-law who died last year was 87. Um, and it seems a natural process. It seems all right. So, I'm not sure I'd be this person if I'd been traumatized. In other words, of course, I was harassed for 16 years by Scientology, and <laughs> there is that. Pretty that does weird. something. <laughs> that is trauma. That is technically clinically trauma. Yeah, and at the end of that period, quite by chance, because I was in into my first divorce, then um, the allegation had been made that I was a mentally ill alcoholic, which, as I was a teetotaler at the time, was a bit weird, and I brought in a, a psychiatrist who did a full analysis of me and to my surprise and hers found that I didn't qualify for PTSD despite you know by then there were 13 years of harassment somehow there was a resilience I wasn't happy that's for sure I wasn't enjoying it but I wasn't you know I wasn't hyper vigilant I wasn't you know withdrawn into myself and you didn't have obsessive thoughts uh, i don't want to get too clinical but that i find that amazing you were you weren't uh, you know fearful and constantly ruminating about uh scientology huh no wow great um, i mean i i you know I, the, the very last period they they basically managed to turn uh four of my close friends against me who started writing affidavits and that was that was traumatizing um, I was also incredibly lucky, however, because one of them, who, who's a close friend, who actually sued me, <laughs> we'd left Scientology, it wasn't because he was a Scientologist, but I later talked with the head of intelligence for Scientology in the UK, who told me that they had five agents who were close in to me, and oh, one God. of them seemed to have been working on this guy. Hmm. and. Getting in, you know, I was so lucky because he made allegations about events that had happened over a period of two years where we'd never, we'd never actually been in each other's company. We'd not telephoned. All of our communication was in writing. And I had carbon copies of all of my letters. And mm. when I reread this quite extensive correspondence, two years of correspondence, his idea that I'd recruited him fell apart. You know, I had the letter where he said he, even though Ron Hubbard's swanning about the Mediterranean with a bunch of girls in hot pants, I want to get in Scientology. And I not heard anything about Ron Hubbard doing that, you know. <laughs> so, you know, but yeah, that was traumatic. But Scientology mm. itself, I, I think from the start, as soon as I understood that the Guardian's office, or the Office of Special Affairs, as it became, was there to harass me, that, um, I, I didn't blame them. I understood what had happened to them that made them want to do these things to me. Mm. And I understood that they couldn't kill me because I was too public. <laughs> and if anybody hurt me, they'd be blamed. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. 
Right. Anything else? I just, if it would be okay, if you say no, it's okay. I, 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 well, it doesn't, it's okay. Uh, is, it, would, would it be okay if I could send you at some point part of my work, my written work? Yes, please do. It may take me a while to get to it, but. It's okay. It's okay. Do. I'm very patient now. <laughs> I don't <laughs> rush anymore. <laughs> it's one of the things we learn. Eh? Yeah. Great. Yeah, I'd, I'd be fascinated. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. There was uh, I, I want to check on check in on your time. There's one last question in the in the chat box that's uh, on the easier side if you'd like. If not, um, it's up to you time wise. No, no, no. Let me have it. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, how would you deal with someone who's spouting mystical manipulation? Well, yeah, it it depends on the form that it takes. Um, I had a very peculiar instance. Um, my friend Hannah Whitfield, who um, worked directly for Ron Hubbard and is uh, a remarkable woman, in my opinion. Um, when we were in Toronto in 2015 and she left Scientology around about 1980 um, and went on to work giving, doing interventions and this sort of thing, um, she talked about Hubbard having this incredible perception that um, somebody was painting the side of one of the ships and he was able from 200 yards away to say that there were hairs coming off the brush and the answer to that is there always will be <laughs> and so it it depends on the instance and and how it how it's put to you but it i have found you know i believed in everything and anything you know I, I was Christian I was brought up to believe in Santa Claus um, that we don't have the Easter Bunny over here really um, but I, I I you know I believed in magic I believed in spiritual things and all of that and I, I, so I think the main thing is to get somebody to tell you the story what it is you know they believe happened I mean I had situations where I had um, a Muslim a Shiite cab driver who told me this story about this miracle that had happened to this woman who'd been a Christian but had prayed to Allah. And then some years later, I was sat with the Archbishop of Crete, who was one of the most wonderful people I've ever met, who told me this story about this Muslim who'd played, played to Jesus and had this miraculous thing. And he was smart enough to see the look on my face and he didn't go any further. You know, I wasn't gonna challenge him, but it's like, yeah. Uh, there's this passage in the Bible where Thomas sees Jesus risen from the dead and says, I don't believe it. And Jesus says, well, put your fingers in the holes. And that's my view. You know, I, I'm with Jesus on that one, that it's, let, give me the evidence. You, you're telling me a story, but give me the evidence. And again, seeking to treat people kindly, not to just tell them they're idiots for believing such nonsense, though of course they are. Um, <laughs> but letting them down gently and, and saying, oh, how do you believe that? I think here, the, the point that Yuval Laura and I always come back to is William James on the idea of noesis, that we have this feeling of knowing. We are sure, we are certain. And the, the story I, I always tell, I, I was 17 and had two hours of a born again Christian trying to sell me the stuff. And, and I happened to just reread the Gospels out of interest. You know, I didn't believe, but and there was a lot of good stuff in there. It was very useful, I thought. You know, consider the tree by the fruit thereof. What a good idea that is. Um, and this guy, after two hours, backed away from me. I mean, he literally walked backwards, I think, frightened that, that I might attack him. <laughs> I'd been polite, you know, I think I had. And he looked at me and he said, I don't understand the Bible, but I know it's all true. And there it is, the feelings of knowing. And mm -hmm. we don't have to live that way. We can say, I've not had sufficient evidence to believe that. And, mm -hmm. and so it is with mystical manipulation. Great, yeah, thank you so yeah. much.
Pleasure. Let me say that uh, uh, a piece of we've got a long list of books here at Cares at Cares Group, like just this insanely long list. But I will confess now, a, a, a piece of the sky has been bumped up, so we can uh, hopefully have you back again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'd love to do that. This has been yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much for for letting me yeah. talk at you for so long. <laughs> <laughs> Deeply appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you well, so much. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Cheers, bye, Great. everybody. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you'd click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.